I have somebody with me right now who was present in a very, very auspicious occasion. Something very amazing happened to him. A building fell down on him about nine years ago. A very special building. Everybody talks about this building. Today they call the place Ground Zero. Huh? This is William Rodriguez, mashallah. The last man out of the World Trade Center, right here. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. <laughs> you hear him say wa alaikum salam? Huh? He can say all this stuff. Say alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Say mashallah. Mashallah. Say I love Guidance TV. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> <laughs> You know what else? The building fell on him, but he was hiding underneath a fire truck. That's correct. Yeah? Yes. And they had to dig you out. That's correct. Yeah, but you know what he told me? He was not a Muslim. We were riding together in a taxi cab. Correct. In London. London, in London. Right? And while we were riding together, he was telling me that all through the experience that he had, he had the only key, by the way. You have the key? This is the only key. It's the only master key used on 9-11 to open all the doors in the complex. So I went floor by floor opening the doors. The fireman actually was uh, uh, following me through the whole process as I opened e each door so people could escape. There were five master keys in the building. The people with the other four were trained on egress, escape, first aid, the whole process of evacuation. They were actually the uh, administrators of the building. They were the, wor the first ones to run out, out of the building. They run out. The first people who left, the ones with the keys, and they didn't unlock the doors. I was a janitor. I was the person that cleaned all the floors in the building. On, on the stairwells, I have to clean them from the 110th floor all the way down one person cleaning 110 flights of stairwells. And I had that, that key because of that, because in 1996 I fell down on the stairwell and I sued the company for a key. Little did I know. You didn't ask for any money? No money. Just no a key. key? Just a key in case of Murta. And Yaves. No, look at that. <laughs> you say Yaves? Yaves. <laughs> Murta for Arabia. <laughs> so in that moment, we didn't know that it was going to be so crucial, but that shows you how Allah prepares everybody for specific reasons, and this is one of the reasons. Now you notice he said Allah. Well, I asked him, what was going through your mind as you were going up and down those floors? One of the things he told me about, the policeman wanted to get some water bottles out of one. Tell us about that. Oh, that was so funny because uh, after I led the whole group of, of, of firemen and a policeman uh, to one of the floors, 27th floor, I remember that the firemen collapsed on the corridor because they didn't have the stamina anymore. And I said, what's going on? How come these people cannot follow me at the same rhythm? But I just didn't realize that I was in better condition physically than they were because I was doing the stairwells every day. So at that moment, the cop t tells me, Willie, do you know where, where can I get water? I say, of course, there's a bottle water machine on the other side. I say, let's go. So we go over there, and in front of the machine, he starts breaking the glass with his wood. Bah! And breaks the glass, and I say, oh, no, I'm getting out of here. I'm the Puerto Rican. They're going to blame me. <laughs> and, and we started taking the bottle waters and we gave them to the to they so at that moment the cop t tells me Willie do you know where, where can I get water I say of course there's a bottle water machine on the other side I say let's go so we go over there and in front of the machine he starts breaking the glass with his wood bah, and breaks the glass and I say oh no I'm getting out of here I'm the Puerto Rican they're going to blame me <laughs> and, and we started taking the bottle waters and we gave them to the, to the firemen and at that moment I saw one of the firemen uh, using the phone in the office area and I said I have to call my mother in Puerto Rico to let her know that you know, there was an accident but little did I know that the whole world was watching this as it was unfolding you have more information by watching TV than we did being inside the building People from all over the world has better, have better information. So when I call my mother, she's screaming, you know, get out of, out of the building. What are you doing? You're crazy. Get out. And I say, mother, I'm okay. Nothing is missing. 
and I'm helping these people in my ignorance who don't know what they're doing, and I have the master key, I will help them up to certain areas. They don't go to the fire. And I lied to my mother, honestly, because I said, I'm not going to the fire, but my intention was to go through the fire to get to my friends, which I never actually got to the fire at that moment. Now, you, this is setting up the story. Little did he know the building was about to come down. Little did he know what was about to take place. Tell us about the lady you helped her out. On the 33rd floor, when I left the firemen, actually they are drinking water because they didn't have the strength, I continued by myself opening doors up to the 33rd floor. When I get to the 33rd floor, I found a lady shaking on the floor, and I said, what are you doing here? She was a new employee, so she didn't know where the exits were. That gives you an indication how many people didn't know what was the process of evacuation. Because, you know, when you have over 50,000 employees in a building like this big, this complex actually, uh, you know, they only have fire drills only twice a year, which was wrong. Uh, at that moment, I said, no, you got to get out. And I picked her up, throw, th th basically throw her on the stairwells. There were three stairwells. There were two guys coming down. I said, please help her down. And I saw how she started going down, and I said, bless her. And I went back in, into, the, into the 33rd floor. Uh, the 33rd floor was a very uh, important floor for me because it's where I had what I call my office. It was actually a closet. And that's where I have all the cleaning supplies. And you know, the, the dust mask that you use for, for not uh, aspiring dust? Well, I wanted to take a box to give it to the people so they would not smell the smoke. So as I'm there, I hear very strange noises on top of me, the 34th floor. And I hear this room, like, you know, something scratching the floor. And I get scared. And um, I, I got scared because I knew it was an empty floor. And the reason that I knew it was an empty floor is because I used to hide for lunch there. So I never wanted my supervisors to find me. And with the master key, I would go over there and hide with my lunch. So I knew it was a construction floor. There was nobody there. So when I heard that, I got very scared. So I continued. It was the only door that I did not open. And I continued until I got to the 33rd floor, uh, to the uh, 39th floor, opening doors and letting people out. When I get to the 39th floor, the policemen and two other firemen came from the other side of the stairwell. And we started to talk about what was going to be the next uh, process of evacuation when we hear, boom! Scare you, huh? <laughs> Scare you, huh? <laughs> Well, imagine me. That was so big, so strong. Uh, it was so huge that at the same time, in our, it came from the other building. On our building, we hear pa, 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 pa. Inside, a, an internal collapse. We hear on the radio, we lost 65, we lost 65, meaning the 65th floor started to collapse inside the building, floor by floor, until it got to the 44th floor. And I was on the 39th floor, what they call the sky lobby. And I said, we got to go up. we got to go up. And my friend, the policeman, said, Willie, you've done enough, but you don't get paid for this. you got to get out of here. And I said, no, I'm going up. He said, Willie, you're still a civilian. You're my responsibility. Get out. I said, no, I'm going. David, his name was David Lim. I said, I'm going up, and I'm going to continue going up. I said, Willie, there's a man on a wheelchair on the 27th floor. Help me get him out. Get him out. So, well, you know what, David, I'm going to help you, but I'm coming back because I'm not giving the key to anybody because I don't want to get fired. Because they told me if you lose the key, you're going to get fired. Like, that would matter <laughs> on 9-11, you know. But I, I ran down to the 27th floor. On the 27th floor, I said, you know, I have orders to get this man out. And as tired as they were, those firemen, my heroes, they stood up. I said, we'll help you. And we started picking this man. His name, Ed Bayer, quadriplegic. He was put on a rescue basket. You have seen those orange baskets that they use on helicopters to rescue people. He was there already tied up, and uh, he has an asthma attack. So we started you know, bringing him down the stairwell. As we go down, I hear explosions in different parts of the, of, of the floor so as we go down. And then we hear another boom. And now the building shakes so much that we lost our footing. The guy on the wheelchair, the, 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 you know, the quadriplegic, his eyes were popping out basically of fear. He was so afraid. And I said, don't be afraid. After this, we're going to go and get a beer. And he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't drink. I don't think he drank either. But that's what you say to maintain the motivation of the person that you're helping with. And uh, at that moment, 
you know, we started going, and I started hearing screams and screams, and it was the people that were actually stuck inside the elevators that couldn't be saved. And at that moment, I say, I look at the firemen, and they were like, like they couldn't do anything. And that was very, very, very shocking for me. And we continue going down. As we go down, we get to the lobby. When we get to the lobby, I see total destruction. You know, the other tower already fell. I have no idea that that happened because we have no windows. We're on the stairwell. And at that moment, I see that beautiful marble that was on the, on the lobby all pulled out. The, the only thing you saw was the cement patches where the marble used to be. And on the left-hand side, which was the mezzanine and the plaza, all gone. And one of the firemen said, prepare the ambulance. You know, I have a rescue jacket, uh, uh, um, a phosphorescent uh, jacket that they, they probably believe that I was a rescuer uh, myself. And so he's like, you know, get, prepare the ambulance. So I start going to the front of the building, you know, by West Side Highway to get the ambulance ready. And I'm in shock and awe because I saw there was not a glass intact. And the revolving doors, the three main revolving doors that were in the building, they were gone. And I guess, you know, it was the sheer pressure of the people trying to escape broke them out. When I get to the actual frame of the revolving door, I see that across the street by the World Financial Center, the area is all cordoned out by the police. So people will not go in in the area. And when they see me at the door, they start screaming, don't look back, don't look back, don't look back. And when they tell you don't look back, what are you going to do? So I look back. And I turned around, and when I look back, brothers and sisters, I saw the most horrible thing I've seen in my life. I saw all the bodies of the people that jumped out that I didn't even know that that was happening because, I had, like I said, I have no windows, the radios didn't work, so we have no information of what was going on. And when I saw all the bodies, I said, oh my God, what is this? And I started crying, and all of a sudden, when I lowered my face, what do I see? That lady that I helped escape from the 33rd floor, I found it cut in half. Apparently one of the glasses from the top of the building came down like a guillotine because of the force of uh, gravity. And it just like cut it right in half. And I saw one part, one side, it's the only body that I recognize because she was already on the floor. Everything else, all the other bodies, you cannot recognize them because of the impact. And when I saw that, I'm crying, and all of a sudden I hear, run, run, run. And the police is running away, and I have no place to run. The whole area is shaking like an earthquake. And the only thing I see is a fire truck. And I said, this is going to kill me. And I say, God, please, don't give my mother the pain of seeing my body in pieces. Let her recognize my body. Ne never ask anything for me, just for my mother, so she wouldn't, ha she wouldn't have that suffering. And as I said that, the building started to collapse right on top of me. Pa, 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 and everything coming down until I got totally, totally uh, uh, encased on concrete and uh, basically uh, buried alive. And remember that dust, that huge cloud of dust when the building collapsed? Well, I was at the epicenter of it. It was such a powerful thing that it just burned your, your skin. But here I am trapped, and the only thing I can say, you know, is about my family, my mother. I never asked anything about myself. The thing is that across the street, that was, uh, there was CNN and Global Vision from Brazil to television station, and they said the last man out was in that area. And that's how they started looking through the rubble until they found me. And when they pulled me out, there were dead bodies everywhere around me. And when they pulled me out, the incredible thing, I didn't break a bone. I was walking. I mean, I have burns because of the, of the dust, but you know, nothing was missing. And it was just incredible. I just couldn't believe it. And then I continued at that moment you know, looking for other bodies. And the important part of my story was that at the beginning, I, I got to work late that day. I was supposed to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I was not going to work. I said, I'm not going to work. It's a beautiful day. I'm going to take the day off. And I called my supervisor and I said, I'm staying home. He said, no, Willie, you're crazy. You got to go come to work. And it was because nobody wanted to do 110 flights of stairs if I didn't go to work. Because they have to send somebody. 
They say, no, if you don't come to work, they have to send me or somebody else. No, no, come to work. So he said, well, if you take care of it, I will do it. So I made it to work, and I made it at 8.30, and I went straight to the basement of the North Tower. Now, when I made it to the basement, is because we have the, you know, the, 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 the time clock there. Um, there were six sub-levels of basement, B1, B2, all the way down to B6. When I'm on B1, and I'm talking to the supervisor at 846, we hear another boom, another explosion, very strong, puts us upwards in the air, all the walls cracked, the full ceiling fell on top of us, the sprinkler system got activated, 14 people in the area screaming out of uh, fear, and this is seconds before the plane hit, seconds. So you see, I thought it was a generator that blew out on the lower level in the mechanical room. When I went to say it was a mechanical uh, explosion, it was a generator, we hear the, ex the, the impact all the way on the top of the building. We hear pow all the way, but you hear it very far away. Two different events separated by six to seven seconds. And of course, you know, a person comes running into the office saying explosion, 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 all hands extended. 33% of his body was burned. His name, Felipe David, nobody wanted to touch him because he was full of blood. And this was 2001. And you know, in 2001, nobody wanted to touch anybody with blood because of AIDS. Nobody. So I put, you know, bandages, uh, actually uh, cleaning towels. And I said, don't move. I'm going to call the police or I'm going to call the emergency medical unit that is uh, on the other building. And when I went to pick up many explosions. Another explosion happened, and that's how I actually led everybody from the, uh, fr the 14 people and the man that was burned from the basement outside the building. Then I went back, got four, uh, uh, four more people out, then went back in and got two more people out that were stuck inside of an elevator. Uh, and uh, you know, it was a process that never ended. The power behind this is that you know, there were only five people that went to Congress to ask for a official investigation about what happened on 9-11, the famous 9-11 commission uh, 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 that was created. I bought the book, by the way. You bought the book? Yeah, well, guess what? I was one of the person behind it. There were five family members. I was one of them. And uh, after a lot of pressure to the government to actually ask for an investigation, they didn't want an investigation. They said, we don't need an investigation. We know who did it. We know who did it. Maybe there's more truth in that than we know. <laughs> yeah, of course it's true. And uh, um, at that moment, it was the wrong thing to tell the families and the victims and survivors. So we say, no, we not want to know exactly what, you know, what was the situation. Brothers and sisters, I testify behind closed doors while everybody or the majority of the people were testifying on television. You saw this on television, the, the famous congressional hearings. I testify behind closed doors. What a surprise. My testimony, even though I was named national hero, I was recognized all over. I was taken to the White House. I met with the president several times. My testimony does not show up anywhere on the 576 pages of an 11 commission report. Uh, but maybe it'll come out in WikiLeaks. On Hollywood. Just guessing. Hollywood Insider or something like that. Yeah, there you go. Well, so it has been, you know, it has been actually, uh, it became a mission to go around the world and tell the truth about what happened on 9 11. Of course, they call me a conspiracy theorist because they have tried everything just to stop me to bring the truth about what happened on that day. And I have not stopped. And that, that was actually was the whole process of becoming a Muslim. Because uh, wait, wait, don't tell that part yet. Now, this is where I met him. William Rodriguez and I were over in London on the television channel called Islam Channel. And we were riding from the GPU event, which is Global Peace and Unity. And on the way over, he was telling a story, the story you just heard. But he was saying something else to me along the way. I was asking him, what was going through your mind and your heart all this time? What were you saying? What were you thinking? No, no, just... just, just the presentation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was telling me that in his heart he kept saying, Oh God, just get me through this. I know you have some purpose for me. Oh God, if you send me... Uh, yeah, the, the mission, you have a mission for me. I need to know. Uh, you got to help me through this. Yes, it's true. So I said to him, now keep in mind, the taxi driver was a Muslim 
And riding with with me was another Muslim. Another guest, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember who it was. Yeah, I, I, yeah, he was just with me recently. Yeah. Anyway, imagine this. I ask him this question because he, I said this or that. He would say, "Inshallah" or "Mashallah," right? Well, I know he's been hanging around with Muslims, <laughs> so I ask him. So, William, how long have you been a Muslim? He said, "I don't know. I never been a Muslim." Exactly. I said, well, how do you know you're not? Is God one? Yes. Has he got partners? No. Is Jesus God? No. Is he a son of a God? Yes. I said yes at that moment. Yeah, you did. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I said yes at that moment. <laughs> at that moment, he said that. And I did this. Yeah, and I said the same thing then. I said, hold on. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> and we talked about that a little bit. And then I said, who is Muhammad? And I said, no, no, you made a great question. You don't remember this. He said, uh, uh, do, you believe in, uh, um, do you believe in God? I say, yes. Do you believe in Jesus? And I say, yes. Do you believe in uh, uh, Moses? And I say, yes. Do you believe in Muhammad? Said, yes. I said, so you're a Muslim? He said, I am. And I was like, yeah, I am. And, that, and then we started talking about what? The son of God. The son of God. And uh, I say, you know, it's incredible. The beautiful part of the whole process was that uh, I was invited to Malaysia before I met the Sheikh. And when I was invited to Malaysia, I get a call from the State Department that said, don't go to Malaysia. He said, why not? He said, because they're Muslim over there. They said, and they're going to kill you there. I said, what? Why would they kill me? He said, yeah, because you represent 9-11, you shouldn't go over there. He said, well, that's ridiculous. I'm going to go to Malaysia because that's the community most affected after 9-11 because of what happened. So they should hear my story, and they should hear the, the concerns of the families. And uh, I'm going. What they forgot to tell me was that Malaysia was one of the biggest supporters of the United States, correct? And that actually it was a very very different story once i got there i got so much love so much respect so much dignity so much understanding from that community from that muslim community that i said what is this it opened my eyes so then i started asking questions over there to all the scholars because i was invited to the islamic international fair over there and um, they used to call me the christian brother defender of islam we, uh, and remember, before 9-11, I, I, I was basically uh, spiritualistic, I used to call it, but it wasn't anything. And I used to laugh at that. And um, um, the beautiful part was that meeting all these uh, scholars over there, they will answer my question, but they never told me, you have to be a Muslim, you have to convert to Islam. Not even one of them. And they were like the top one, the top you know, mentors. And that was a process that started until the moment that I met the Sheikh. You see, it was just that seed, the importance of talking and actually uh, uh, answering questions and opening people's minds and people's hearts to realize that you know, what they were selling on television and the propaganda and the media was totally the opposite of what I was personally experiencing with the brothers everywhere, you see? Alhamdulillah. So you got the first-hand knowledge of what Muslims are really all about, even though you weren't one yet, Correct. and they treated you good. Now, what we did next, sitting in that taxi cab, was so amazing. The cab driver, he pulled over to stop. In the middle of the highway. Yeah. This is the middle of the highway in London. That was, you know, everybody got out of the car, correct? And we did? And what we did was? Shihada. Shahada. He did his shahada right then and there, mashallah. Yes. Allah Akbar. And since that time, if anybody asks him, he says, I'm a Jewish Christian Muslim. <laughs> well, we were on a radio show last year. You remember that? Yes. yes. And they tried to pin you down. They called in this caller in on the radio show. Oh, well, well, are you one of those Muslims? Are you and it's like this? They want to know. He said, I'm a Jewish Christian Muslim. I believe in the God of the Jews, the God of the Christians, and the God of the Muslims. I, learned, I, learned from <laughs> learned from, I definitely learned from him. But at the same time, you know, the Sheikh can tell you how much we have been put on our, you know, uh, as a risk uh, constantly. This is a, 
uh, the media calls me all the time. Maybe you have seen some of the interviews on CNN or Fox or a anything that has to do with the mosque uh, uh, by ground zero that they want to build, you know, the attacks that they have done. You know, you will find me protecting the rights of people to do whatever they want. Uh, the, the issue of uh, bringing the truth out. I mean, it's been a constant effort. And they attack me constantly, but I know that I have a mission that comes from something bigger than them. Alhamdulillah. By the way, regarding the Ground Zero Mosque, I was down in Florida over that Quran burning business, which came up at exactly the same time. William called me while I was on my way over there. I actually, the radio show happened while I was changing airplanes. I was on the ground, though fortunately, the time for my plane landing till the next one took off gave me enough time to do the radio show and still make it to the gate in time to go. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And, 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 and I was doing the, 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 the not, it was I also, I asked you to give me some counseling because I was doing the television show. Uh, it was CNN. Remember that the guy wanted to burn the Korans and it was like such a big thing worldwide. This wasn't national, it was worldwide. And uh, I say, Sheikh, what should I do? I said, very simple. Tell them, thank you. That's the right way to get rid of the Quran. You're doing us a favor. Yeah, in the fiqh of Islam, when you want to destroy a Quran, it's burning is number one. So you want to burn it, we'll just send you a bunch of the Musahaf, which are damaged. We have some here that are damaged, and we'll send them to you and by the truckload, and then you can burn them and deal with the environmentalist people. MashaAllah. Thank you very much. And by the way, I told him the same thing I told Sheikh Musa. Musri, who is the, from Egypt, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, he's from uh, Syria, and he's the big sheikh down in Orlando, Florida. And that is what he told that guy. They didn't put it on the news, but that's what he told him and took the steam out of his engine. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he was up here and dealing with the subject of what? About the people who were saying that, hey, we didn't say that. Correct. Remember they said that all the people were saying, oh, we don't want that mosque here. Yes. The, the family said it. Here's the truth. The families never said that they found a group of 12 people, 12 family members, extreme right uh, Republicans that actually were used and manipulated by the pol politicians. The, the, the politics got right into it right from the very beginning. But the majority of families, victims, survivors, they didn't care, honestly. Because, you know, first of all, it was not in ground zero. Second of all, we had other issues that has been going on for many, many years, like the two topless bars right next to Ground Zero, like uh, the porno video store closer to Ground Zero. That was more immoral to us than anything else. What about the peddlers selling pictures of uh, the people jumping out of the windows in the area? I mean, it was so many things that it, it was disgusting to us that they were actually using us and manipulating us just by a group of extreme right uh, 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 people that we didn't even support. These are people that actually were against immigration, immigrants, and you know, I'm Puerto Rican, and uh, even though I'm American born, uh, I you know, basically protect the, the, the immigrants as well, especially the undocumented. So I saw this whole uh, uh, um, uh, effort to, to, to divide and to use race, and what a better thing than to create a, uh, an issue with the, with the Islamic center. It's not even a mosque, so. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. One of the things that I'm doing right now is to let you understand how important it is that we have our voice. Did you notice something? Nobody edited out anything he said. We didn't go to any commercial break at any particular time of the interview, did we? <coughs> How important is it 